Hey everybody, it's Lisa Marie here, hanging out today with Rusty Roberts, one of my dear friends, and we've got an interesting story about how we became dear friends. We haven't really known each other that long, but we have hit it off really big, like we've known each other for years. And that's what I love about you, and I love about all my little special like little angels that come into my life. But God yeah. puts people in your life for a reason. We talk about that a lot on the channel, and I just wanted to invite you guys to our conversation today. we got a lot to talk about. We've got so much stuff. We're, we have a relationship that has just started, basically, but it's like we have known each other for 100 years, so it's really, really cool. So I hope you guys enjoy it. So talk to me. Today, you're here hanging out with me, and we're, we're going through all this discussion about our entrepreneurship, and you do all this stuff, and I do all this stuff, and there's so much so much coolness yeah. to being able to move and, and move and change and not be in one thing. So many people get stuck in this one they job do. life, and that's not mine, and that's not yours. No, I appreciate you having me on here today. Uh, you know, I'm like an octopus. I mean, I've got tentacles everywhere, and... You know, everybody's like, my wife says, I'm in a, a silent attention deficit. <laughs> yes. I'm the, it says, no matter, you may be sitting there looking like you're paying attention, but really your mind is out here somewhere. Oh, going. yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've always been like that. Uh, I guess it started when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, when, you know, when you're growing up, you have the, the, your money blueprint or your mentality stamped into how you're developed, where you go. And, and I can remember when I was a kid. You know, I grew up in Louisiana, and one of my favorite toys was a spoon. Really? A spoon. You know, we used to go out, and we, I ate dirt, okay? We used to make mud patty, cow patties, and we'd throw them each other and play in mud holes. And, yeah. And my cousins, now they had a little more money than us, and they were well-to-do, and they had the nice Tonka trucks and the little back coes and all oh, that. Oh, yeah. Okay? okay. Well, I had a spoon. I figured out I could dig deeper than they could with their little back coe. Mm -hmm. So, I said, that's cool. But, uh, you know, one of the things that shaped me when I was growing up is uh, you always have the illusions of grandeur. And you, I, I was poor, but I didn't know I was poor. Right. Which right. didn't bother me. Nope. <clears throat> but That's the half of it. It's the half of it. But I can remember when I was probably, I don't know, 11 or 12, something of that range. And I can, I could tell my, I told my mother, I said, one of these days, mom, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to be, I'm going to be building up. She said, dream on boy. Yeah. Now, dream on, boy, I could have taken that one of two ways, mm -hmm. okay? I could have taken that to where, okay, I am in a situational standstill. I will never get above this ceiling where I'm at right now. I'm going to be like everybody else. I'm going to go to a nine-to-five job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work a sawmill. I'm going to go work in the logging woods. I'm gonna, all these are in very integrable jobs, mm -hmm. and I've worked most of them. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Mm -hmm. Or... I could take the path of going, you know what? You're not going to limit me, and I'm going to show you. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And so I took the mindset of I'm not going to be placed in a ceiling. Nobody's going to put a ceiling over my head. And I'm going to be the only one to blame if I fail. Right. I love that. Yeah. And, you know, I have, people would say that I have failed at a lot of things. The truth is I've never failed. No. I have learned something every one of them. I've taken that knowledge and I've and applied, applied it, it to, the next one. to the next one. And so here I am. Yep. Well, I mean, you and I were talking, you're a vet, you're a vet, you're, uh, you were in the desert storm. Desert storm. Yeah. Uh, we're about the same age. Our children are about the same I'm age. 49. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm 49 times two. No, you, time. you guys know how that is rolling because last year I almost died on my birthday, right around my birthday with the heart cath. And this 31. year I had. I didn't have any ding dang power and any water running. Yeah, that's how we met. That's how we met. So, yeah, yeah. and so I decided I was not going to have my birthday again. My fiftieth birthday is not happening again this year. So maybe next year I'll be where I'm supposed <coughs> to be, February the twentieth. I'll be somewhere half naked on a beach with some margaritas in Mexico. That's right. With B and not have to. What's the deal? Birthday's got to be the right celebration to call it the five O. So that's right. But, um, you know, for me, it's been interesting because I think that the same philosophy is there. You know, mother got killed when I was eight, and daddy, I grew up in a house where everybody was labeled. So I was the one that looked just like mom, and I was the pretty one, and I was the one that everybody always would see me, and they would be a little bit sad because I looked like and acted just like mom. 
right? <clears throat> and so that was always sort of a, a thing that was happening undercurrent, especially with my grandparents, her parents, you know, and daddy. And then my sister was like just brilliant and looked just like daddy. And he was the surgeon and he just put all of his eggs in her basket, expected her to be valedictorian, expected her to become a doctor like him, expected her to do all these great things. And he wanted me to just marry somebody that would take care of me. And I was supposed to just make pretty babies and do junior league and all this stuff. And, and I was like the more <clears throat> driven of all five of the children. And as we look today, all these years have passed. Daddy's been dead for 18 years. I'm the only one that has the entrepreneurial drive. I'm the only mm -hmm. one that has this sort of balls to the walls. Nothing's going to stop me. Oh, that doesn't work. No problem. Right. And I'm going to work around, work around, work around and figure out <clears> another <throat> way of morphing into something bigger, better than whatever I was before. And COVID has been a crazy time for everybody. But, you know, I mean, I could have, I guess, gotten upset and not done anything and, yeah. you know, just let everything fall apart around me. But I just decided to to start the YouTube and to do what we're doing here today on Martini yeah. Talks and just do be reinventive. That's right. You have to just do that, you know, and, and like you said, that almost all the jobs that you've owned or had businesses that you've owned and done have occurred out of a desire that you needed it. Exactly. Or the people in your tribe needed it. Correct. And you waved your hand up and said, I'll figure it out. And then you created it. And that's the same thing that I've done for my people too. So yeah. it's just really interesting people that are not entrepreneurial, they don't understand that. Well, I never considered myself entrepreneurial. I just did a lot, you yeah. know, but a lot of people that don't understand, they're, they're so set in, I've got a nine to five job, I'm secure, I've got a house, and I'm okay with my subsidies, I'm okay paying income tax, I'm okay with all this stuff. That's, those people, God bless them, that's what they want. Mm -hmm. Me, I look at the, you know, I, I look at it going, why can't I be a Bill Gates? Exactly. Why can't I be a Warren Buffett? Exactly. And they say, well, you don't have any money to get started. Well, that is an obstacle. But I'll get there. Yeah, but you know what? Not all people who are billionaires no. started out with That's a right. pocket That's, full of cash. They started out with an idea. Yeah. And it's just a matter that they didn't give up on that idea. Yeah. And so this is like this COVID deal. You know, I came to you to basically do some adjusting for insurance. I got into insurance because I was bored. Because... I had been laid off from another big oil company about a year and a half ago. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not doing anything right now. So what am I going to do? So I'm like, well, I want something that a service that's required that everybody needs me, not necessarily has necessarily wants me. Right. So I said, then I started down the appraisal path and trying to get into appraisal is a lot of mess. Well, I'm going to tell you how much of a mess it is. I approached a lot of different appraisers to take me on to be an appraisal trainee. All the doors were shut. I said, you know what, nobody's gonna shut me out. So I went through Champion School of Real Estate. I said, I'm gonna be an appraiser. So I signed up, I took a hundred, I took their- All of that stuff. I took the 150 hours of courses. I, know. I did it without even having nobody to sponsor me. I'm talking about taking a step out. Oh yeah. You know, that's like, I'm gonna gamble, I'm gonna learn it. Then after the fact, you know, I, I, William's getting sick over here. Uh -oh. We're gonna have to edit that out. He's hairball. Well, he actually—that is a hairball, which is yeah. good uh, to see that. Not good to <clears throat> have him do that, but he just got diagnosed. Everybody on the channel knows Williams. Oh, they know William. William is—he um, just <clears throat> got diagnosed with hypothyroidism, uh. and so our vet Brian, who goes to church with us, he saw him and. He said he has to have special cream in his ear and, and yeah. he gets nauseated. He's been in that chair all day waiting for us to do this together. So yeah. I did not know if he would wake up and just be sick or if he was just yeah. doing whatever. But it is it is It'll what right. it is. So we'll just have to. It's all right. It's but all right. So you're talking about your journey through being an appraisal. Yeah. I was amazed when I was in. So I told you I had my license back in 1990. 91. Okay. At Champions. I went to Champions mm -hmm. School of Real Estate too. And I was with Century 21 on 1960 at the time. And then I wanted to be in big houses, like, right. I wanted to do big houses, not <clears> these <throat> little tiny 322s yeah. that my father-in-law was investing in, which is what brought us to Houston. And I didn't want to go collect rent from people with, they were pulling guns out of their crotches. And I mean, it yeah. was not a good scene in Greenspoint, no. early 90s. 
And so I let the license go. But when I got back in there, they were like, oh, I can't believe that you let your license go. And oh my God, it was so much work for you to get your license. And you should have just kept up all your classes and all that stuff. And I said, well, I'm getting it again because daddy's died. And we got to have access to HAR. And we need to be able to look at what we're doing. And, and I've got clients <clears throat> that are using me for their photography and their travel. And they want me to list their houses. And so I'm going to offer that service to them as a courtesy yeah. but during the classes there were a lot of people talking about being being an appraisal and i was like oh lord that is like a whole nother level of headache mm -hmm. i mean awful <laughs> so i'm committing you for even bothering to go that route because that's well not what i, I learned would... a lot i bet you did and i have yet to this day ever found an appraiser willing to sponsor me to be an appraiser after all that school after i got the training license and everything uh, you know, you go to an individual. I had several appraisers told me, no, you're competition. Okay, I, I get it because I, I, I live it. in the same area. Uh, most of the appraisers right now are pro in their 60s or later. I mean, they're nearing retirement and they don't want to take on a trainee. Okay, so there you go there. You go to the big companies, like I had to, they said, well, you need to go to the big appraisal companies in Houston. Okay, okay. the big firms, you know, the CBREs and all okay. of those. Okay, so, all right. I approached, I have approached different, all those, and all of those were, no, we're not hiring downturn, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, the doors kept getting closed, and I went, you know what? I don't have to do appraisal. I'll do adjusting. Yeah. That's something else to learn. Yeah. And so I went through adjusterpro.com, 40-hour course, pay your four or 500 bucks, and when you pass their test, you're licensed in Texas. Now, being a licensed appraiser, uh, adjuster, does not make you an adjuster. Okay, all right. Just like you go to school to be a welder and you come out and you pass a welding test. It doesn't mean you're a welder. You're yeah. not a welder. But it's kind of like a realtor too. It's just like a realtor. You can pass a test, but you have to learn a the A lot ropes. of stuff. What I had going for me is back, I shut down my construction company back in 2019. And so I had a lot of experience before and even going through Harvey, uh, you know, renovating houses and restoring oh, yeah. them, building them back. and and that was just my neck, you know. I've been in construction for 25 years, mostly of it now in quality management and project management. So I know what it takes to build from ground up, inside out. Mm -hmm. So adjusting was not hard for no. me. It just a matter of, you know, put me in, put me in the game, coach. Throw me in, you know. And then they ask you, well, do you know anything about adjusting? Absolutely. Have you ever done? Yes. You know. So it's, I got thrown in the ball game and baptized by fire. Yeah. Sometimes and so, that's the best way. And, and I've done well with it. I'm yeah. okay with it. And so that's kind of like, you know, back to how we met. But I'm glad we did. Mm. Uh, I've, this, uh, a lot of people experience a lot of trauma because of this winter storm. They did. And a lot of them are having flashbacks to Harvey. I mean, I went into one house in Houston where they were gone for three days. And they get a call from their neighbor. Hey, you have water running out of your house, out of your garage, out of your front door. <sighs> Well, they get back after three days, water running <clears throat> and being froze. Well, that house, this is, this is a three-quarter million dollar home. And when they open the doors, four inches of water throughout the whole house. So they're basically cutting walls at 16 inches or throughout. I mean, everything's lost. Everything. You know, and this, so I'm, like, I'm able to sympathize with them and go, listen, this is a process that ain't the end of the world. I know it's an inconvenience. Here's how you get through it. And so I've been able to help people get through some of this through this time. Well, I sent an email out to all of my people and I said, if you guys have had damage from pipes busting and your photography is ruined, don't forget like Katrina and Ike and Harvey, it's covered under your homeowner's insurance is, is covered. Yeah. Because my work, you've been in the house yeah. and you know, my work is some, some of my pieces of art for people's children are yeah. thousands and thousands of dollars for one piece alone. So yes. if their whole house is covered up in Elisa Murray photography and framing, oh, yeah. you know, they were freaking out. But I did not thank God yet hear from anybody on this last run that yeah. I think they did a good job of letting people know to turn off the water. They did. And, uh, you know, that was, I also told a lot of people, turn your water off, drain your lines, open your outside spigots, get all the water out. And a lot of people forgot to drain those outside, outside spigots. spigots. And that's where a lot of the breaks happened. But at least they got most of the water out. Mm -hmm. uh, I was amazed when I walked in your house and I said, I hope that you don't have no leaks in your house because your whole house is, a, is an art art piece. It's a yeah. canvas. Every wall, every ceiling 
And if you've never been in this house, it's a beautiful house. Thank you. Well, I remember, yeah. you know, whenever I called, I, you called me, you called B, you called B, and, yeah. and then I called you, and I told you. I said, I have just finished, and I this is before the stent surgery, because this was yeah. Harvey. I have just finished hand painting all these walls and ceilings. And now, because of the channel, each room is a set. It the is. The kitchen is a set for the Sweet Life Kitchen channel. Mm -hmm. The garden is a set for the Sweet Life Garden channel. Yeah. The dining room is a set for the Sweet Life DIY. The This the room thing has a purpose. is a specific yeah. set for the Martini Talks. And I was like, holy hello, Dolly. I ain't letting her rip. I ain't uh -uh. turning on pipes and letting her rip. No. I don't have the energy to go back and hand paint the ceilings and the walls. I yeah. mean, like, it's just, it would be thousands of dollars to Oh, redo. absolutely. Yeah. And you're like, just, just take a deep breath. <laughs> you know, like I told you, I said, the best thing you can do in this house here is put a plumber on his hands and knees and rub down every pipe. Well, he went in, my granddaddy came in and he went, <clears throat> he went into that attic and he blew air through it. That's good. And he worked a little and then and then I made him a big old pot of chicken tortilla soup there you go. and I went and looked out there and he's in the yard laying out on his back and he was taking a little nap in the sunshine and I said where are we and you weren't he had gotten some food somewhere else I said you weren't supposed to eat that you were supposed to eat my cooking and he said we're fine Elisa everything's gonna be just fine I'm getting ready to open him up and I must have given him a big old eyeball look and he looked at me and he's like, don't worry, darling, it's going to be okay. We're not going to let the house get messed up. Yeah. And sure enough, but the yeah. nicest thing is that he went out there to the garden. And, and he said that if I would get the pipes, that he would actually put in the sprinkler system so all of the beds can be watered without me having to hand water them. Oh, yeah. That's and good. that he would just exchange that for photos of his grandson. So I thought that was really sweet. I love sweet. the barter system. I do, too. I, I love it. I thought it was really sweet of him to do that because it's just, you know, it is traumatizing to have a house. We had the roof fly off, you know, in terms of, of Harvey. And we had the tornadoes came out here and really? did all kinds of mess. We had water flying through the windows. We were catching them with, with uh, big coolers just flying in through the wow. windows <laughs> and pictures flying down off of the walls. And it was an absolute disaster. I mean, it was just crazy. The pipes at the pool were messed up and... And I was just like, what else is, uh -huh. what's that name in that movie with Chevy Chase where the, or yeah, maybe it's Tom Hanks where the, they buy the house and it's just, oh, is it the money pit? Money pit. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was just like that. But I was like, what is going to happen next? I mean, it's just, so we just got done. So I understand how you were running into people who had just finished getting everything right. Yep. And for me, like, you know, that den has got, is set up to photograph brides and quinceañeras. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the curtains were $15,000 just for wow. the curtains on one window. Yeah. So it's like you can't just have, it, it's not like you just put it back together like that. No. It's not, that's not that simple. It's a process. Yep. It's a process, an expensive process. And, you know, from my st I, even this morning, I'm still taking phone calls from, you know, insured clients that are, you know, they're not really upset. But they're, they're just confused. Why don't my insurance cover more? I'm like, well, you know, insurance covers for damage. And like in this house here, you had no damage from an insurance standpoint. Even though all your water lines are busted and broke and things happen, people are going, I pay insurance to have that fixed. Well, you don't. insurance, you know, you got Is inconvenience. It because I, you know, I was talking to a neighbor across the street. Because he lost a hot water heater, but he's got pecs in his house. Because we're one of the most original houses to this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're like 20 years old. Right. And they're all way younger. He, he said, do, he asked me, he says, do you think it's because they cannot ensure the workmanship of the plumber? That is correct. That's why the Texas policies yes. don't cover the it pipes. It goes back to the, the, the craftsman installing it. It goes back to the manufacturers of the actual pipe. There's a lot of things that is out of control, out of the control of the insurance company. Yeah. It's not theirs. Or, you know, I've got, you know, a lot of these, I mean, I've, they've tried, I've had people that have tried to claim that my door got, got frozen and I walk in, well, your door's rotted four foot, four inches up from the floor. Or I had this crack just happened in my concrete slab and went, no, you got dirt and debris and that crack's been there for a long time. It didn't just happen. Uh, people are trying to get. Yeah. There's a lot of insurance fixed. fraud. 
or people trying to get a lot of things fixed. And so let's file a claim and see if we can get it. Well, they're disappointed whenever somebody like myself shows up. And knows the deal. And knows the deal. And every house we go to, we're playing investigator. Okay, you have a water leak. Okay, that's fine. You have no pipes right there. How'd that get there? You know, and I'll go in the attics. I look at things. and going, well, and I go, oh, you got a roof issue. You know, those other things. Um, or, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of that. So. That's crazy, it's, too. But, you know, you can't blame people for trying, I no, guess. No, well, you pay I, just, money per I year. just really, I remember I called Crystal because Crystal is, the, our insurance <clears throat> lady, is the godparents. Her and her husband are the godparents of yeah. the children. And I called her and I said, um, I've almost frozen to death in this house. I have been huddled up with, with two balloon chairs oh, made yeah. in the igloo with the two cats outside that don't get along with Mr. William inside, all huddled up in like a little doodah. And we got, I'm having to light the stove with a, a thingy yeah and I have no clean pots and pans and I do not camp I am the one yeah. person in the world that and she's like laughing because she, she knows I mean I won't I do not camp I don't care I don't care if you put me <laughs> in a air-conditioned tent with martinis served poolside on some whatever I, I don't camp so that's this funny. has been an experience for me because I don't I don't like anything that's outside of the norm not I'm not the princess I don't have to have the very best of things right but I do need running water yeah. and hot bathtub. There are certain things that just everybody, yeah. I feel like, needs to have. But I, she said, she goes, well, Lisa, I just love you so much, but no policy covers the pipes. Yeah. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. I am not the only person in the world that thought that they did. Yeah. I mean, I just assumed if you're turning off my power mm -hmm. and you're responsible for allowing my water to freeze into my pipes and I did not yeah. God didn't do it the grid did it yeah that's right the grid did it somebody up here directly chose to turn it off or God which then screwed up my world and now mm -hmm. I'm supposed to find the money to pay for this and the way the insurance probably looks at it is the insurer has the obligation to mitigate damages by draining your pipes taking necessary precautions, having the pipes wrapped, having the water running, et cetera, et cetera. And so I get it. Yeah, well, you get it from both directions. I get it from both directions. And I get it from both directions. But I thought to myself, yeah. take the person who has not um, who's not worked for a year. Oh, this is a financial And they've already run through their, all of their savings, and they're not on, on a, there's no unemployment, and they mm -hmm. haven't gotten a job, and they haven't recreated another one for themselves. Right. And they don't have any, and they have rental property, and they're not being required to pay rent, and you got tenants taking advantage of you because they know they can. Exactly. So you've got all these circumstances happening that are all in and of themselves bad, yeah. and then you turn off the power, and then you allow the pipes to bust. Which I didn't allow them. They were really thin, and they were copper, and they were old, and they were. Yeah. Some of them were insulated with that rubbery thing around yeah. it, whatever styrofoam yeah. thing around it. But some of them weren't. Uh, where's the average person going to find they're the not, money? They're not going to find. They're it. just going to live in a house. They're going to cap off lines and temporarily. I went to one house, and this, this every repair in this house was made by using basically a heater hose out of a car, rubber. And they went and cut their copper pipes, slid with hose clamps, and put it in hose clamps that, and turned the water back on. I went, you know what? Pretty smart. He fixed his own lines temporarily. He said, I can't get a plumber. He said, I'm out of water. What do I do? I said, sir, you got my respect. You fixed your problem until you can get it handled. I said, that's good. I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't have thought of that, you know. But I spent... Me and my, my family, we spent basically five days without power in League City. And we were huddled around our living room. We had a, Luckily, we had a gas log fireplace. Yeah. We hung blankets in front of doors to and just keep it We warm. kept our little cocoon of warm air right there and slept in the living room. And everybody kind of just slept right there for the four days while we rode it out. And I would take, uh, I mean, I, I cooked chicken nuggets on fire i boiled water i made oatmeal over the fire yeah you name it we cooked on that little fire but a lot of people didn't have gas logs either yeah or wood so uh you know what do you do well there, we, we had that fireplace but that fireplace i mean we used the stove in the kitchen to do the cooking and and the 
charcoal and stuff we had out there in the grill. I mean, but it was too slippery and slide. I mean, I've got the Berlenta on board. Yeah. I fall and bust my tail out there, and then I'm bleeding internally, and that's a whole other level of problems. So yeah. the boys were like, no, Mama, you don't need to go out there and slip around. on the." I was out there trying to feed the birds, too, and they were like, no, we'll take care of the birds. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to live a sweet life and take care of these blessed birds. They were little itty-bitty baby birds that were freezing their tails off. They oh, had yeah. just been hatched. They weren't expecting to have this thing happen. But, you know, it's all good. It's all going to be fine. It's all going to work itself out. And in the end, like I said, you know, we've got two hot water heaters that are busted. We need to fix one. One's working. One's not. Whatever. We'll get yeah. to it when we get to it. But uh, it could be a lot worse. And I'll tell you, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collars, asparagus, all are happy. The tulips are popping. The only thing that we got going on out there that could be considered a disaster is the lettuce and the uh papayas are all just mushy gushy gross and the dragon fruits but yeah yeah, it's just a couple of things that were placed it's no big deal Mm. you know and i put the 52 tomato plants in on saturday it's nice it'll be fun it's gonna be great but we don't need it to happen again and i don't think Uh, that texas is going to let it happen again i I, think that there's gonna be some fixing on the way that the power grid is done i think there'll be another little cool snap before april or may you ever read the Farmer's Almanac? I got it. It's right there. Yeah, I got it. Well, there's an old, old saying, I think, if it, if it thunders in February, it'll frost in April. Okay. And so that always tells you, usually, end of March, 1st of April time frame, there'll be a little cool snap. It won't get as cold as it did last year. No, 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 no. But, no. yeah, I've always, uh, I've always loved my Farmer's Almanac, especially when you're planting by the signs. Uh, all your gardens, whether you, when they say the signs, a lot of people don't understand what the signs are, but I was raised on a farm. Yep. And you didn't plant peas on certain days. You didn't mark or cut pigs on certain days because it has to do if the signs are in the feet or if the signs are in the head, it all affects different things. And yep. People are like, well, that's mumbo jumbo. No, it's true. But there's a lot of truth to it. Yep. Just like, uh, you know, the signs can be in the feet and you dig a hole with a post hole digger. I always tell everybody I got a PhD, post hole digger. <clears throat> you do. Yeah. <laughs> and so... But like when the signs are in the feet, you take the dirt out and you try and put the dirt back in, your hole sometimes is not enough dirt to fill the hole up. Mm-hmm. But you take the dirt out, and again, the signs might be in the head, there's too much dirt and the dirt mounds up. You're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. I just took it out of the hole. Why ain't it? it ain't going right back. It's something different. Anyway, I have no idea. Well, you know, and one of my daddies, he said that he wanted me to plant by the moon. That's right. His daddy had done his, all of his gardening on what I'm, what I'm doing, mm-hmm. which is food had been planted by the moon and that the moon would make it a better product, a better harvest. And that goes back to the signs mm-hmm. on the lunar times. Same thing with your, if you're hunting or fishing. A lot of times I'll, I'll plan my trips, my hunting or fishing trips. I will plan them sometimes six, eight, ten months out. But I'm looking at the moon phases. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at a lot of things that go into planting it. That, because you want to come back with some fish. Well, I want to come back with some fish. And, you know, like uh, a lot of people don't know that there's like a three-hour window twice a day that animals have a biological clock. It's time to eat. For you and I, we have, oh, it's noon. It's time to go eat. Right. But for animals, that moon's gravitational lunar cycle determines when the moon is directly overhead at 12 o'clock or underfoot at 6 o'clock. And they know. About an hour and a half before to about an hour and a half later. So that's your peak. And if you look on your tides, they'll tell you a peak and a low. And that's what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Same thing with hunting. Same thing with animals. If you're going to go out and be a bird watcher, you want to plan your trip. You don't want to sit there for 10 hours all day long. If you go out in a certain window of t- time frame, you're going to probably see about 80% of the animals that would naturally be traveling through that area mm-hmm. or flying or whatever. Mm-hmm. So anyway, a lot of science to it, but... It's cool. Maybe it's folklore, myth. I don't know. Oh, no. But it, I, I, I believe don't think it, it is. I don't think it is because Nana always had it and she lived to be 102 and we had farms in North Carolina and yeah. that was common talk, common talk throughout my childhood was, was the Farmer's Almanac, what does the Farmer's Almanac say? And I would even tell people when they were wanting me to take them down to Galveston <coughs> to shoot them at sunset, I'm like, well, we got to go look at the Farmer's Almanac and figure out what it's going to be this year and when it's going to yeah. sunset and we'll know what we need to do and how to plan to get down there and all that jazz. Wow. Talking about your gardens. You plant okra? I do. Do not ask me to pick it. I have a story on that. One of the best butt whoopings I ever got. Really? Oh, yeah. Now, our gardens, 
when I say gardens, I'm talking about a football field in length. Yeah. And 30 rows wide of maybe purple hull peas and green Wonderful. crowders and corn. Yeah. Like I say, if we didn't grow it or kill it, we didn't eat it. Right. Okay, that's, on, that's farm life in the woods. Well, anyway, I didn't like okra. I didn't like eating okra. I didn't like picking okra. And I was probably about nine years old. My dad said, okay, boy, it's today, go pick the okra. I didn't want to pick the okra. Well, I got the butcher knife, as normal. Yep. And we go down there and start picking the okra. And, and the more I picked, the, the matter I got. And it got to where I was flicking, it. flicking it. And then it got to where I was cutting the tops. And about oh, no. 20 yards down there, I started cutting them off at the ground. Oh, no. I cut off about four rows wide and probably each one of these rows are probably 50 yards long half oh, a football field no. and 45 minutes later, i went back to the house my dad's like boy did you pick the okra or no he said boy did you cut the okra i said yes sir where's that in the garden you cut it yes sir get in the truck oh, rusty. anyway oh, <laughs> by this time no. my papa come up now my papa was pretty rank i mean he was a good loving man but i'll tell you what that old man could talk worse than a sailor oh really up one side and down the other well he he got in there he come up there with us and they walked up to the edge of that garden and it was my grandfather was just i'll be i bet you just don't want to hear the rest of it and all thing i heard from my dad was oh yep i heard that belt come out and i turned around and by that time he already had me i did circles in that garden <laughs> and i got my butt whooped and he still made me pick the okra. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but to this day, I'll eat, gu I'll eat gumbo with a little yeah, bit of okra in it if it's cooked just down. Yeah, really but got a bad taste in your mouth about I the don't okra. do I don't okra. blame you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, the first year I grew okra inside the pool, and it grew tall inside the gate, you know, around the pool. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. It grew in there, and it was fine, and it was no big deal, and, and it was easy to get to, and it was no big deal. So then... The next year, I decided that I wanted more okra. Mm -hmm. So I put the bed that's now covered, but the first bed that was in, that's in the garden as you go into the garden, I had that whole area covered with okra. And we had them, they're about that high off the ground. And we went to North Carolina to visit mom. And when we got back, they were this short. The deer had come out. Really? And gnawed them all the way down to the ground and done to them what you did with the knife. And of course, once it's done, it's not growing back. Yeah, That's the yeah. end of the okra. Yeah. And so then the next year I put it on the other side of the pool and it didn't get enough sunlight, so it didn't do very well at all. But the problem with it is it's so tall, you can't cage it. And, and we've got deer walking around here at night. So it has to be, I either need to find a modified, you know, heirloom, short mm -hmm. version that maybe i don't know if they even make it because i've never seen it before but it would be really cool if i could find one that doesn't grow any bigger than like maybe You're talking about the plant yardstick yeah but yeah. every single one of the okras that i've actually planted yeah they bigger get than six me. eight foot long they're bigger oh, than yeah. me yeah yeah they're bigger than me so but yeah it's a learning curve i'll tell you it's a learning curve because i planted corn and then the corn was pretty yeah but then you open up thing and there's no corn in there it's just not in there. It didn't happen. Yeah. It looks good. It's pretty for photographs, but right. when you open it to eat it, you can't. Didn't pollinate. There's correctly. nothing going on. Yeah. yeah. So it's been an interesting trial and error. But tomatoes, I'm really good at tomatoes. That's why I planted 52 of them because, boy, good. I can plant some tomatoes. And the strawberries, this is the other funny thing. Uh. I didn't cover those strawberries <clears throat> up with the storm because mm -hmm. in North Carolina, we get snow and ice and strawberries are really easy to find in North yeah. Carolina. I didn't even cover them and they're happy as they can be. They're just absolutely having a blast, just as happy as they can be. And so I was like, man, that's crazy. I guess they like it to be cooler, which might be the reason why it's been so difficult to grow them here. Because Maybe. in the heat of the summer here, they it just don't up. like it. Yeah, They just don't like it. So, well, you're getting ready to embark on another adventure because you've got multiple adventures that you're always doing. Yes. So what's uh, your next adventure? My next adventure is I will be traveling overseas to do a little consulting and project management and on some uh, projects for another oil company. And so uh, I've worked for these oil companies over the years doing big projects and mo mostly quality management, quality advisor type stuff. And so this role came available and uh, I'm like, it got brought to my attention and I'm like, well, yeah, I, 
I would like to throw my name in the hat, yeah. you know. And so, because, uh, you know, the oil industry right now, after last year, a lot of oil companies were not doing anything. No. There were no all the projects are shut down. And and so, uh, it's just one of those things, an opportunity came available. So, and I try not to mention any names of who I work right. for or, or where I'm going or how long I'm going, but uh, it'll be, uh, I'll be out of country for a little while, mm -hmm. but uh, it's worthwhile. It's going to be an opportunity to train again because what I'll be doing is uh, kind of a liaison between the contractors and the oil companies for these projects to help them get their quality and safety up to par, up to par, up to code. We're going to be building this in a third world country, which is basically, uh, but to, to us standards and codes. Oh, that's good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just like the ASME and all these other codes that were established, you know, 100 years ago is because we, we, in the oil industry, we've always said most rules and regulations are written in blood. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's true enough. That's the reason that a lot of these were because somebody died somewhere, somebody got hurt. And so you implement rules, that, codes, yep, standards yep. to building. And uh, well, it's like mama, whenever she got killed, they didn't have any of those um, guard, guard things, you know, like she, yeah. they didn't have it. It just in 1978, it didn't exist. Yeah. And, you know, if it had existed, she'd be alive. Yeah. So I'm sure that she's not the only person that got hit by a train before <clears throat> somebody came up with the, the bright idea that we might want to put a little rail down. Now, if you go through the rail, yeah, that's a whole nother. That's different. But if you got a rail, you can keep people from crossing the Safety railroad measures. tracks, then, you know. Well, you know, at one point, I, I would probably say that I've managed it sometimes up to about 5,000 people on some jobs, you know, speaking to them. And what I try to uh, tell the people is like, first I get a buy-in. Who's into safety? Well, oh, everybody raises their hand. Oh, sure. Now, who's into quality? And, you know, I get a few yeah, here and there. I said, I said, let me tell you, today's quality is tomorrow's safety. And they're like, huh? I tell them, I said, what you're building today, whether you're building a bridge, you're building a building, you're building a pipeline, the quality of your work today, if something goes wrong next week, next year, 10 years from now, your kids might be working at that refinery. Your mother may be driving over that bridge. Yeah. Because of today's quality measures and procedures, is what sets the length of time that that's safe. And that's what I try to tell everybody. Today's safety is tomorrow's, or today's quality is tomorrow's Tomorrow safety. Safeties. And once they start looking at it like that, then they, you kind of get a bite. You, you start to get it. I'm not here to be a pain in your butt. I'm not riding you because I want to be. I'm riding you because somebody died at some point. Somebody's blood was shed because the quality was not there, and it led to a failure down the road for safety. And so once you start preaching that, and it's a culture. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be an ERCOT culture, too. It is going to be an ERCOT. Winky face. Uh, it sure it is. It better happen soon. It sure is. Yeah. I was at Ed's Pharmacy <clears throat> picking up Berlanta, of course. And Ed's is an old pharmacist here in Missouri City. Just like growing up in North Carolina, it reminds me so much of, of my pharmacist that I would grow up visiting with Daddy. You know, old-timey, yeah. old old-school pharma pharmacy. And they were in there just raising cane about windmills and all kinds of stuff. They're just so bad. A bunch of old men just no, in there. Yeah. Rah, 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 rah. And I was like, they're going to have to make some changes because people died. People froze to death. People, well, they did. They lost a lot of stuff. This has not been a good situation. And that was totally mismanagement on ERCOT. Uh, it was, I, I would, I'm going to say 100% political. I believe so. And, uh. I don't even want to get started on politics. No, because we're always sweet here. We're always sweet. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what. I keep God first, family second. I love my guns. You know, and there's a lot of things that I can say I voted for because I stand on different reasons. It's like when I was in college, I wrote a paper one time about the different uh, stances that people take. What, what focuses, what makes them vote the way they vote? Right. Okay. I came up with like a, about 146 different platforms. Yep. Whether it's guns, abortion, religion. Right. You name it. Right. 
and most people are. Give me that if that's bothering you. Yeah, I'm just tucking this, keeping okay. me busy. I'm on. Okay. It's all good. But most people are one issue voters. Yeah, a lot of them are. There are one, okay. And uh, I have to say, you know, mine is guns. I love my guns. Can't have enough of them. It's like women in shoes. You give me another one. But, uh, you know, each one of us has circumstances that we go, we're not going to cross that line. Nope. You're, not, you're not doing it. Right. But there's so many people that are blinded by irrelevant things that affect millions of other people. Right. Because they want to find something to, I'm part of a movement. And really, it's not making a difference. It's not making one bit of difference to society. No, and you know what's interesting too, Rusty, is that way back before all this crap happened, right, before COVID, James Edward was getting ready to graduate. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend of mine who was the first martini talk that I did, and he's a comedian and a mental health worker in Houston, which is a great combination. Oh, yeah. Great combination. Great combination. like a Robin Williams gig. Yeah. (laughs) And he and I talked, and I said he wanted me to go on stage. Because when you get to know me and, you know, really get to know me, there's a lot of stuff that will just come flying out of my mouth. And they're like, oh, my, he's like, oh, my God, you'd just be so great, Auntie. I just want you to be on stage. And James Edward was like, please don't do that, Mama, until after I graduated from high school. Because I just don't want to have all that and a bag of chips happening at school because oh, he's yeah. in a private Christian school. And mm-hmm. there could be a lot of ramifications, potentially. I mean, like, I don't yeah. know that I would say anything that would be uh, an eyebrow raiser, but I might. Who knows? You yeah. know, you never know because there's always these people at different levels of where they are on everything, mm-hmm. right? You don't know what nerve you're going to hit. Oh, but yeah. now that we're in this culture that we're in right now where you can't say a thing PC. without it really coming back to haunt you or cancel you. That's right. One minute you're there and, and the ne- next minute, poof, you're gone. We need you to resign. And just uh, for no. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. I just I said, you know, I, I had often thought that I would write a book. I think now at the moment that I'm in mindset wise, if I were to write a book, I would write a book that would not have my name on it. I would write the book yeah, and speak the mind, but I would not own the name to it because yeah. I would be fearful of it creating a problem for somebody. And it could be oh, yeah. anybody because the way that you, you don't know... It's so weird how one little tiny, it's like a Forrest Gump thing. You've got the little feather in the wind, and one minute you could be happy with somebody, and you say one thing that you never would have thought would upset their apple cart, and you Mm. didn't have the intention of upsetting their apple Mm -hmm. cart, but because it just sort of was something that you didn't even really know was part of their apple cart, could create a termination of the friendship. And for me, the brand... Is everything. I mean, I'm building this brand. I'm That's building right. this stuff. And I don't want to upset or, or hurt anybody's yeah. feelings. But you can't even really speak what you really feel. You can't. Unless you know who you're with. And then you can. But then you still don't always know. Yeah, I try. My, I have a very slight filter a lot of times. But I've grown through education and training to keep my mouth shut. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, it's just crazy. I, I, just, I just know if I can't please somebody, then I'm not going to say anything or try. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah, one of those things. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Avoidance is it's probably better. the best. If you know that you're walking into a confrontational situation, either avoid it or learn how to deal with it. Or just be quiet. Just be quiet. So I've learned just to be quiet. You know, uh, now I embarrass my kids all the time. 99% of the time, if you see me, I'm in overalls. My boots, usually my jeans are outside of my, tucked outside of my boots. And my wife said, can you please put your pants legs down over your boots? Not act such a hick. I said, (laughs) I'm I'm in disguise. I went out yesterday and found Brian out there with overalls on. Not overalls, suspenders. Yeah. He's sitting out there petting Sasha, sitting on the back of some tractor part. I was just like, buddy, are you all right? Because I was trying to find him for something. He's like, yeah, I'm just tired. I've been out here moving stuff around in the yard and trying to get everything moved around and just got a little winded and had to sit down. It's like, you look so much like your daddy right now wearing those suspenders. It was so funny. You know, it's a funny thing that people judge you how you dress a lot. That's like oh, uh, Henry Ford, you know, inventor of the mm-hmm. Ford. 
he was in Winfield, Louisiana. That's where I was raised. And there was two dealerships there, P.K. Smith and uh, another Chevrolet dealership. And he went to this one dealership, and he was wearing overalls. No, it wasn't Henry Ford. It was uh, Sam Walton. Sam oh, yeah, Walton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Sam Walton. I'm sorry, Henry yeah. Ford. He went to the Ford dealership. Sam Walton went to the Ford dealership. Right. Then he went to the... He went to another dealership, Chevrolet dealership. We pulled up the door. He was wearing his overalls. You know, he's the one invented a Walmart. Yeah. So he pulls up there in his old pickup truck and he says, I want to buy a truck. And they look at him and they really don't give him a time of day. And, uh, and he, they said, okay, well, how are you going? I'm going to write you a check. Oh, okay. And they kind of blew him off. And he stood around for a little while. He got pissed off. So he went and got in his truck and drove back down to the Ford, uh, the, the, uh, the Chevrolet. Yep. He walked in there, and old Mike Smith, he, he, I'm friends with his son, and uh, he said, I'd like to buy a truck. Yes, sir. And they handled him, they, he's, even though he was dressed like a farmer. Yeah, yeah. They, they said, yes, sir, come on in. They helped him out, and they said, uh, how would you like to pay for it? I'm going to write you a check. Okay, sir, not a problem. We, we took his check and went back, and the lady called his bank to verify. They said, ma'am, if he wanted to buy that town, he could buy the town. His money's good. And then he, he he rode that truck back over to the uh, other, other, other one, honked his horn and said, told you I was buying one today. And so there's a lot of people that try to play the game of perception, you know. And if you're not real with yourself Can't and you're not comfortable, and you, if you're not comfortable in your own shoes, then you're not going to be comfortable fooling anybody else, Mm-mm. you know. You can't fake it to well. I say you can't fake it till you make it, but you can. You can, but it, you shouldn't. Your true colors will show eventually. Yeah. And people you normally reach their highest level of incompetency when they reach failure. Our president right now, matter of fact. But who said that? <coughs> Did I say? La that? la 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 la. la. Anyway. My friend Rusty <laughs> crossed the line. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I didn't say that. It's okay. No, it's fine. It's good. It's fine. Anyway. I I just absolutely refuse. To, because I have children that watch me. Yes. I have a, I, I have in my mind, it might just be in my own mind, but I have in my mind that I am for them like Mr. Rogers. Yes, absolutely. Right. Uh, I show them how to grow these beautiful <clears throat> things and show them how to cook things and draw and paint and, and be sweet and kind to each other. And there's no place in the world that can disrupt that more fastly than in politics. Absolutely. And so it I just a lot, said, a lot you know what, I, I, I just won't. I mean, people have said, what are you doing? And I'm like, not writing about it in my column, not Mm-mm. discussing it on my shows. Um, if you know me clo- closely, you know exactly yeah. what I am, but it's none of anybody's business. Otherwise. I don't even put it on social media. No. I don't oh, do any Lord, of it. No. Just nothing. You know, no, it's about, all about William the Cat on social media, and here's my cucumbers that I that's made. Right. <laughs> here's my salad I made tonight. <laughs> I'll tell you, whenever it comes to kids, when I taught college for four years at San Jack, and I was teaching welding technology and inspection and metallurgy type stuff, and uh, remember I told you that I always thought that a good boss is the most subservient to his employees. Yes. Okay. Well, I took that also to heart with my students. I always wanted my students to excel past me. And so, you know, in my class evaluations, and I hired a lot of my students, I got them into inspection, that later they actually became more, had, had more licensings than I did and passed me up. And I've actually called them boss on other jobs. That's cool. You know, and uh, the secret to success is networking. Getting a good network of people that watch your back Mm -hmm. because if you're by yourself you can't you're gonna get eat and so that's that's one of my most prideful things that's why i'm so glad that you came into my life because i've always believed that everybody that's here is in my life for a reason sure every single thing that's happened is it has happened for a reason if mother hadn't gotten killed i wouldn't be who i am i would have married probably a doctor and sat around and made babies all the time and had a little nanny and bridge club and parties just like my mom yeah I would have just been a duplicate copy of my mom, but because I had to fight and do what I had to do to do what I had to do, yeah. I became who I am because of that. And, you know, if Victorian's photos hadn't made it to the cover of the magazine, which was absolutely a god wink, I would never have been seen by the Astros. I never would have been hired to be filming photographers for 22 years for all these wow. beautiful families yeah. if they hadn't featured me on the magazine cover and made my neighbors angry because I'd violated the deed restrictions by having the studio in the house. Yeah. 
we never would have had the column living the sweet life happen. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Every single thing happens for a reason, right? And so mm -hmm. you can't grow. If I had not had the heart stent and COVID happened, I never would have had the time to do the YouTube channel. Yeah. I never would have realized that the legacy that I'm living and leaving is not just about photography. It's about lessons about life and martini talks and sharing yeah. with people friendships like we have That's and right. like we have with other people and, and what it means to be kind and sweet to each other and it's just a huge bigger picture That's right. vision of all of it. You know, I really honestly believe that if more people focused on trying to help their neighbor without the thought of monetary gain, that so many doors would be open to them, you know? Uh, you know, I hear a lot of, you know, we hadn't got into scripture or anything like that, but I know you, you're well versed. But, you know, one thing I always ask people when I'm trying to talk to them, and, you know, they're saying, well, I've, I've prayed a lot, and I've, I've asked God for this, and I've asked God for that, and I'm like, okay, well, let me ask you one thing. I'll ask you one thing. I'm going to get your answer. If you could ask God for one thing and one thing only, what would it be? More time. Why? Because I have so many things that I want to do, so many lives I want to touch. Okay. And it's every day more and more of a realization that that's all we've got. And you believe in prayer. I do. Absolutely. And do you know the difference between faith and belief? Well, let me tell you a story. I was going to say, let me think about that, Rusty. I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> I can tell you that, but I have to think on that for a minute because you, well, well, you threw me for a loop a little bit. And then second. I'm going to revert back to the prayer. Okay. Okay. Had this guy on his bicycle. He comes up to the Grand, comes up to the Grand Canyon. You have a crowd of people on this side. And you have a crowd of people on that side of the Grand Canyon. You got this wire just across there. He's going to ride his bicycle across Grand Canyon. Now, he's like, okay, who here believes I can do this? Yay, we believe you can do it. We believe you. He's got the crowd going. Okay, well, so he takes out across there, and he's going across that wire, and he's, he finally gets to the other side. The other side is cheering him on, loving him. We believed you could do it. We believed you could do it. We knew you could do it. He turns the bicycle around. He said, now, who believes I can do it again? Hey, we believe you can do it. Hand me that 50-pound bag of potatoes. Put it in my, my basket. Now, who believes I can do it? Yeah, we believe you can do it. Okay, we're behind him. We're, here we go. He takes that back across the Grand Canyon. It's wobbly in that basket. I mean, it's just, he gets to the other side, barely makes it up on the other side. Everybody over there is like, yeah, we believed you could do it. We knew you could do it. Way to go. He turned the bicycle around again, and he said, now, who has faith I can do it again? Hey, who's getting in the basket? Everybody's quiet. Mm -hmm. That's faith versus belief. Mm -hmm. So then it gets back to the question again, if you could pray for one thing, time is a good one. Yeah. If you talk, you ask that question to a thousand people, you get a thousand different answers. Yeah. There's really only one correct answer. Okay. Okay. What is it? Okay. If you get more time, what if you're terminally ill? Well, yeah. Okay. Oh, I want more money. Okay. Well, you can have all the money you want. What if you're unhappy? What if you, what good is the money? Okay. Um, the list of things goes on. Oh, yeah. But what I tell everybody, I said, what is the one thing that King Solomon prayed for? That if you had that one thing, you could have your time, you could have your money, you could have your house, you could have your, you could have anything in the whole dwelling of, available to you if you had one thing. Wisdom. Yep. That's why Nana used to always say, wouldn't it be great if I had the wisdom that I have now? At 102, yeah, but the body of a 50-year-old. <laughs> well, that, you know what? Uh, if, right. I had, if, if I was 21 and know what I know now, I'd be dangerous. Yeah. I'd be in trouble. So it's probably best. It's best that God... It's I best I've earned every one of those gray hairs. It's best that God has set, has set it the way he has, but it's yeah. still, I, you know. That's the only thing, I think, and that really came to light for me, the time thing, whenever I was like, why am I, why am I shooting seven days a week? Why am I shooting seven days a week? I don't need to shoot seven days a week. Yeah. Why do I feel like I'm, why am I not spending time 
doing some things creatively that I need to do creatively. Really? Why has it always been about somebody else? It's time to stop and breathe and play with the butterflies a little bit and That's think it. about life I'll... in a different way. And COVID's been good. COVID has made a lot of people step back and think. One, they've learned they can work from home. They well, can do I've a lot of things. Always done that. But I mean, but yes, it's been a lot of time. It's given a lot, given a lot of people a lot of time to sit back and think because you had nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's just made my mind get all gobbledygook trying to figure out which tomato plants to plant <laughs> and how to get rid of that feather-footed nymph in the garden with my eggplants and all of that stuff. Yeah. But well, I just, I just feel like you're like an old brother. Yeah. An older brother, even though you're younger than me by a couple of years. It feels yeah. like I've known you my whole life. Well, good. It's really cool. It's very cool. Well, I'm glad you had me here today. It's been fun talking. Well, you know, he told me when he called me up, we were talking about we didn't need to adjust. We were going to unadjust the adjusting because yeah. we didn't need to do that. We're just not going to do that to the insurance company. We don't need to pay to yeah. the deductible to fix what we can really pretty much fix ourselves. And and he was upset because he'd been in here and you forgot to take pictures of the house because you wanted to show your wife. Cause I, you're yeah, building, I wanted to show my wife the one. house. I mean, this. You're building one. Yeah. And so I invited you back over here to hang out and visit and take as many pictures as you want to of it. And God knows I use it for pictures every almost yeah. every day. And if not that, for filming. But um, I had somebody this morning. Everybody always thinks that this backdrop when I'm Zooming is fake. They think that this is some sort of photographed backdrop oh. for Zoom, which I just think is hysterical. So I'm like, no, yeah. those are my orchids, and this is my office, and 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 I'm, yeah, I don't I don't understand. But I've been surprised, not surprised, but I'm a, I guess shocked is probably the right word. How many people live in a white house? They're just living in a white house. And well, you know, I've I've actually seen so many houses that are big houses that are not furnished. Really, people buy the big house because that's the image they want, but they can't put furniture in it. Wow. And that's competing with the Joneses. Wow. If I could give advice to anybody, is set your path. Yeah. Don't worry about if your path does this, because that's part of learning to get, let's say the, the straightest point, the shortest point between two points is a straight line. Right. Well, you may not like what you're at right now, but you need to go through where you're at right now to get where you need to be. Yeah. Because without that, you're going to get there where you think you want to be, and you're going to be lost. Well, and because God puts every single step there for right. a reason. If you were to tell me in 2006 that I would have a channel, yeah, I would have looked at you like you were crazy. If you told me in 1985 that I'd be an award-winning columnist, I would have looked at you like you were crazy. Yeah. Every single step in my life has been a stepping stone to the next thing that God had planned for me. And I believe strongly that it's all a God thing. I do not have mm -hmm. any, there is not one you could, I don't care what, I know you and I are faith, faith yeah. Oh, yeah. centered, but there are people that would like, oh, well, no, no, no. <laughs> I'll tell you one, I'll make this our final story here. I'll tell you something. When I was started looking for my property that I'm going to be retiring to, hopefully, one of these years. Soon. Soon. Sooner than later. Yeah. But I've been working at it for a long time. Yeah. I didn't have a path. I didn't have two nickels to rub together. Okay. I I knew that at that time I was financially broke, but I wanted the dream. I said I can only afford maybe five or ten acres. But I wanted this property to be somewhere either a wildlife management area, a conservation area, a navigable river. National something Forest. Like I wanted that, something yeah. that I knew it would be small, but it's big. Right. I have right. access to something. Yeah. So when I was in my 30s, I started asking older gentlemen around my neighborhood, why did you retire here? Well, this is my grandkids live here, so we're close. Okay. Why did you retire here? Well, I'm a snowbird. We just come down and we bought a house and we decided to stay. Okay. Why did you stay? Well, I enjoyed golf. I like living on a golf course. Okay. So everybody has their reasons majority of the people are not happy where they retire. Mm. Okay, what I found out. And I said, you know what? If I can afford or if I have control to retire anywhere I want to, I'm going to pick it. Sure. Why now, not? And this money, I don't have the money. I have, so I took out second mortgage on my home, tried to had liquid capital. I knew how much I had. 
I did all the math on the bank. I said, okay, I know I'm qualified for this $190,000. That was all in, done. Right. I have no more money. Don't right. know where to beg, bar, steal it, rob people. I can't get no more money. So I wanted tall trees, but I wanted mountains. Right. Well, Texas is a big state, but it don't have We both. don't have none of that. You got mountains out west. You got tall trees in the east, yeah. but they're not together. No. So I said, you know what? I don't mind driving maybe two times a year to a location to where I can justify paying for something to go see it. Okay. And I'm going to make real estate my investment. I'm going to pay for that. Same thing as I put money into a stock market. So let me putting it there. I'm going to invest it here and get it back. So I took where I lived in Lake City, took a compass, and I went 12 hours. Okay. That's my first drive. I had friends in Illinois who I like to visit and hang out with on the river. I said, you know, if I'm retired, I wouldn't mind driving up there for a weekend trip, maybe eight hours. Okay. So I went from where they lived, eight hours. I said, we like going to Colorado, doing some things there. I don't mind driving for, say, a two-week trip. I don't mind driving 24 hours. So I went where we hang out. I went 24 hours. Did the same thing for Disney World. Long story short, I had like five circles. They all came back to like northeast Oklahoma, northwest Arkansas, southwest Missouri. I circumscribed and said, I'm retiring right there. And that's how... You came up with it. That's where I came up to where I'm on. That was a 200-mile radius, so 400 miles across. So I started taking uh, plant ownership maps. We started taking vacations. And we'd go ride the country. And see where you, yeah. what you like better. Who owns it? Is it? How big is it? Call them. And then our first piece of property, we want to be the first. We tried a lot of them. But long story short, my wife said, I need to be at least 30 minutes from a Walmart. You're okay. not going to drag me out in the middle of nowhere. Right. Okay. Easy. I took every Walmart in that circle. I drew a circle, 30-minute circle around every Walmart. Not a problem. Then I alleviated everything that wasn't National Forest, Wildlife Management, River, right. Night, you know, whatever didn't meet my parameter cr cr criteria. Long story short, I found this one piece of property, and everything I ever bought has never been listed. Came up to one of them. Yeah, because people were still living on it, owned it. Well, these I found it was better to buy a property that was absentee owners because they don't live there. They own it. They're in another state. Oh. So call them. I don't think they'll say no. Well, yeah. So I called this one person. There was three of those people's names in this one little section of Oklahoma. The I'm third sure one. You're still green. You're still yeah. green. Yeah, the third one. I said, yes, we own some property in Missouri. I said, would you be willing to sell it? She says, oh, you're a godsend. I went, huh. Okay. It's a little T god wing there. Tell me. Tell me about it. She said, well, her and her husband back there in 2008 and the housing industry dropped and everything. Oh, yeah. And they said, we had planned on, uh, we had planned on retiring over there and building, but we have a ranch in, in Oklahoma and et cetera, et cetera. I said, okay. I said, uh, long story short, I said, well, would you be willing to sell it? She said, yes, we, we really have thought about it. And so... I said, well, what would you take for it? She said, well, can you make me an offer? I said, no, ma'am. I said, I know I'm on a fixed budget, and I'm not going to do that. I know what the property's worth. She said, well, we need 250000 for this 58 acres. I said, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate your time. It's well worth your, it's worth every penny you're asking, and, and I'm not going to try to mess with, mess with you. Yeah. I'm not going to do it, so I, thank you. I said, we've got a young family that's starting out, and I said, that would be my dreams on a place like that, to leave a legacy for my kids and my grandkids. And I said, okay, thank you. I went to hang up. She said, well, hang on a second. Let me get your number. Okay, so I gave it to her. About two weeks later, she called me back. Mr. Roberts, my husband and I have thought about it. And would, can you come up with 225000 I said, ma'am, your property is worth the two fifty dollars you was asking. If I, had, I, if I could do it, I would. When I tell you I'm all in, I have sunk every penny I can manage to put into the pot to know what I'm qualified for, to know to get that piece of property. I mean, I'm all in, and I'm not going to insult you with an offer for that. I said, but thank you a lot. I, I really, if you ever come down, let me know. I'd love to walk your place. I'd love to see it. I mean, just, anyway. So we hung up. A month later, she calls me back. Mr. Roberts, my husband and I thought about it, and we like your family. Can you go 202000 and pay closing? I said, ma'am, I don't know where I'm going to find another $4,000 above what I have right now, but I said, if you'll give me 60-day closing instead of 30, I will find it 
and make it happen. And that's how we got our first place. See? And then it was just a, a process of accumulation. Five acres here, 10 acres here, 200 and something here, 317 here. It just, I started pulling it and now I, we have a little chunk. Got a nice chunk. A nice little chunk on Table Rock Lake, beautiful place. Yeah, nice little chunk. And uh, yeah, I better get invited to come see you. You will, you will get, get invited built. if you love Branson, Missouri. If you've never been, I've there, never been. Oh, so great! Oh, we love Branson. It's kind of like the Bible Belt of the Midwest. You know, any one given night, there's like 146 different shows, and you have a Silver Dollar City. Uh, you have Sight and Sound Studios, which has the most awesome plays, whether it's Noah or Jonah and the Well. Or that's awesome. They just it's the theatrical part of it was just beautiful. But, but yeah, all that property was, was by faith that yep. I got that. And I'll tell you how I know this. The property around me that I picked up through accumulation, basically, one of the ladies adjacent to me, she owned about 600 acres. And I had part of a property that was kind of landlocked because of terrain, big, deep creeks and water. I mean, just, you couldn't get to it. And I had, it, had to go through my place to get to it on part of it. And uh, I tried to work a deal with her, and I never could get financing for it. I just didn't have the money, but yeah. I was trying. I said, "Man, I'll do. We do owner financing. Uh, we do lease to own. We you do, you name it. I threw it at her. Right. And she wouldn't do any of it. And when I, anyway, I had a contract on it, and it fell through for lack of funding. And the long story short, I, I told her, I said, "Ma'am, I am the buyer of that property. I said, I know you, I know you want to sell it, but you need to sell on it for about five years. I said, I'm the buyer of your property. I already know. I feel it in my heart. The good Lord's already given that property to me." She says, well, if things change, you let me know. I said, okay. And in the process, it was almost five years. Mm -hmm. During that process, she had four different contracts to purchase it, and every one of them fell through. Mm -hmm. Then I finally went back to her. I said, ma'am, I'm ready to buy your property now. You ready to sell it? She said, yeah. Everybody else can't seem to be qualified for it. I said, well, let's do it. And so that was my last big purchase. Now Thanks we're for waiting house. for me. Yeah, so they, they, I, already, I said, I told you five, six years ago, I was, I was the owner of it. Yeah. You just had to wait for me. But no. that was that was faith. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. It's just a matter of uh, rolling the dice, and you know you don't always know the path. You don't know always know that something is going to happen. It's like people with, wanting to have kids. Well, I'm going to wait till I'm ready to have kids. You're never You're ready, to, ready have to, kids. to have kids. Never. If you've got a dream, do it. The longest step on any journey is the first one. Yep. Start it. Like I said, owning a business is easy. You want to be a CEO? Start your own business. Yep. Start it. You can be a CEO tomorrow. That's just less than a thousand bucks, probably. You can be a good lawyer and be less than that. <laughs> yeah, for sure in Texas. That's yeah. For sure. But, you know, don't let anybody hold you back. No. Nope. If you want something, go for it. Only thing people can do is tell you no, and then you learn how to figure out how they can't tell you no. Right. Exactly. You take the ball in your own hands. And you say, no, this is my court. You can't tell me no. That's how I got into the oil industry. Yeah, nobody tells me no. They know better. Yeah. They don't tell you no either. And on that note, yes. we're going to yeah. sign off because we could sit here and talk for another three or four days. And yeah. I'm hoping that you guys have found some value in this because I just love hanging out with people that are like-minded. Boy, it just feeds my soul. I love that. Well, <laughs> I love I'm going to get me another one of these cowboy martinis. Uh, well, it's called black coffee. It's called black coffee. Listen, if you found any value in this, do us a favor, like and share. Don't forget to ring the bell so that you're notified when we drop another episode next week on Martini Talks. And I want to thank you so much for being here. It's really, really wonderful. Been real. Love it. Yep. It's good stuff. You too. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye.